Hi everyone. Thank you for joining the third webinar in our series on animal-free recombinant antibodies. This series is being co-organized by the U.S. National Toxicology Program Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicological Methods, or NICEDAM, the European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, and the PETA International Science Consortium. My name is Katherine Groff. I'm an advisor to the PETA International Science Consortium, and I'll be co-moderating today's webinar with David Allen, who is the president at Integrated Laboratory Systems and principal investigator of the contract supporting NICEDAM. We have two speakers today who will be presenting on the application of animal-free recombinant antibodies. First, we'll hear from Dr. Julia Russo of Abcalis, and then from Dr. Charu Chandrasekara of the Canadian Center for Alternatives to Animal Methods. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to point out that a recording of this webinar will be posted at the link on the screen shortly after its completion. Information about additional webinars in the series can be found at this link. There will be time for questions for both speakers at the end of the second presentation. Everyone is on mute, but you can type questions or comments in the questions section within your GoToWebinar toolbar at any time during the presentations, and we will ask them at the end of the presentations. This toolbar should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Speaking first today will be Dr. Julio Russo. Dr. Russo is the co-founder and chief scientific officer at Alcalis, which developed sequence-defined monoclonal and multiclonal recombinant antibodies using phage display. He has extensive experience in the generation of animal-free antibodies at Alcalis and at the Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany. Most recently, Dr. Russo has worked to develop SARS-CoV-2 human recombinant antibodies for diagnostic applications. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Julio. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks for the very kind introduction. It's my pleasure today to be here and introduce Abcalis, a very young startup company spin-off of the University of Braunschweig, located in Germany, Lower Saxony, as you mentioned, and focused on the generation, production, and characterization for diagnostic applications of completely animal-free recombinant antibodies. Today, I want to focus on the way we generate recombinant mono and multiclonal antibodies as substitute for animal serum diagnostics. But before, please allow me to mention uh, the success that animal-free phage display-derived antibodies achieved in the therapeutic field. As of today, nine antibodies have been already approved, and as of August 2020, 53 are in clinical trials. Such success is due to the many properties and advantages that are offered by the recombinant technology, and first of all, the possibility to select human antibodies right at the origin from naive universal libraries that can be then converted into full human IgG antibodies so to reduce immunogenicity for the patient. Also, working with sequence-defined antibodies means scalable batch sizes and unlimited reproducibility. The phage display technology allows to steer the selection process so to obtain epitope or conformation-specific antibodies which help when selecting for a specific function like neutralization. Also, the display allows a posteriori to improve stability and affinity of the antibodies using mutagenesis libraries. And last but not least, with molecular engineering, it is nowadays possible to switch from monovalent antibody formats used for the selection to bivalent full IgG antibodies, or maybe tetravalent uh, or esameric, so bispecific formats, but even CAR T cells or maybe it's possible to just modify a small portion of the antibody, even a single uh, residue in the polypeptidic chain, so to facilitate site-specific conjugation and the generation of antibody drug conjugates. So all these benefits made the recombinant antibody technology animal-free so potent in the therapeutic field. And then the question arises in my head, these properties are also beneficial for diagnostics and research. And the answer is obviously yes, just with an impact at different level. For example, using animal-free human naive libraries allows to reduce animal farming. Sequence-defined reagents allow to mix different monospecific uh, sequence-defined antibodies so to form recombinant polyclonals with known composition and unlimited reproducibility. Also, the fact that we can customize the selection process allows to avoid to select antibodies with unwanted cross-reactivities, which means false positive in diagnostics. 
and also uh, again is surely valuable to improve stability or affinity afterwards and maybe change the format so to adapt it to the one that better suit the final diagnostic setup as well as the fc species to be used as of now abcalis already works with four different uh, full igg uh, different species antibody format that can be swapped and need with DNA cloning. But now the question is, if there are so many advantages, why these antibodies are not routinely used in diagnostic and research? Well, there are multiple reasons for that, but for surely the first is conservatism. Uh, the diagnostic market is smaller and less dynamic than the therapeutic one, so changes take longer to take place, and also uh, it's more than 40 years that animal-derived antibodies are established in the field. On the other side, we have an awareness of all the uh, potential and the positive example that uh, the recombinant antibody uh, world can offer, and sometimes also uh, the lack uh, of knowing which are the commercial sources and opportunities. And so Abcalis finds this place as company that aims at offering a concrete alternative to animal-derived diagnostic reagents uh, by the production of mono and multiclonal sequence-defined antibodies generated by phage display. But in the first place, why do we want to actually replace and substitute animal-derived antibodies? Well, there are multiple reasons for that, and we maybe will go through it along this and the many other presentations that this beautiful webinar offered. Uh, but I like to start with the fact, and this study from 2008 is just a, a snapshot of the situation in the, uh, the uh, market of antibody for research, where 5,000 antibodies in the study were collected and tested from different providers in two different assays simply to verify their claimed specificity and was found that more than 50% of them actually didn't recognize the target at all or showed additional cross reactivities. And uh, in some cases, this is because of poor characterization, but there are also intrinsic limitations, especially in the polyclonal antibodies that account for these problems. And uh, surely I'm talking about undefined composition. Polyclonal antibodies uh, are constituted by a mix of different antibodies that are both uh, those raised against the antigen used for immunization, as well as uh, all these other antibodies that characterize just uh, the immunological profile of an animal that has its own experience of uh, uh, diseases and uh, pathogen infections. And all these antibodies, of course, have different reactivities. But even looking only at the antibodies that are specific for the antigen, we don't know how many of those are actually working in our assay, how many of those may or may not uh, show cross-reactivity to other antigens. On top of that, we have that animals, despite their suffering, uh, are limited in uh, their uh, uh, capabilities, and they can offer only limited amount of antibody, which accounts for batch-to-batch uh, -batch variation, and finally, low reproducibility. And all of this adds up at a cost for the user that is uh, a university or uh, an institution or a private user. And this has cost also for, um, in terms of final product that is generated because of the risk of unspecific reactions that in diagnostic may account for false positive reactions. And overall, the product is clearly not the most continuous. On the other side, we have sequence-defined recombinant antibodies that are produced in vitro, in mammalian, or possibly also in insect cells, and uh, uh, in scalable batch sizes, with low batch-to-batch -batch variation and, in principle, uh, against any target. The fact of combining, then, different monospecific recombinant antibody allows to generate a mix the which composition is fully defined. Overall, what you obtain here is a, a fully recombinant polyclonal, a multiclonal that is animal-free, unlimited in batch size, and fully reproducible. But how do we generate these products? Well, first of all, what we have to do is to obtain an antibody gene library, a universal library that is made by collecting many B cells from different donors all over the world, and then extracting from these B cells the antibody gene that are uh, encoding for uh, the variable parts of heavy and light antibody chains. These gene fragments are then recombined together so to increase diversity beyond what actually nature could offer. And uh, secondarily, they are cloned into a specific vector that allows bacterial expression as well as packaging inside the capsid of the filamentous phage, which later on is going to contain the genetic information encoding for one 
protein, and this protein is the antibody fragment that is going to be displayed on its surface. And this is the magic, uh, the key feature of the page display, the coupling of the genotype with the phenotype on a single entity, which is the antibody phage particle. In this way, it's possible to select one single monoclonal antibody out of billions of different antibody phage particles, which constitute the library. After the monoclonal antibody gene is isolated, can be converted in the format of choice, produced and tested directly in the final assay or it can be mixed with other antibodies and later on validated. And so the question arises, when do we need actually multiple clonality? When is it really usable? And this is essay dependent. We show here an indirect ELISA setup where human IgG is played, immobilized and detected either with one of our human rabbit recombinant monoclonal IgG or with the uh, rabbit polyclonals. And you see here that uh, the overall uh, signal and even the apparent EC50, so uh, the binding is in, uh, in all sense very similar. So that maybe in this particular say the detection range is such that it's not important to have increased sensitivity. But when we change the up, for example, to a sandwich ELISA setup, which is much more common actually in diagnostic, where an antibody is immobilized to a plate and used to capture the analyte, again a human IgG in this case from patient Sira, we see that the performance of the monoclonal antibody in black is particularly poor compared to the multiclonal. And this is rather reflecting the uh, capabilities of a polyclonal GOAT anti-human IgG we see. So in the end the question is uh, how can we then be sure that mixing antibodies together, we are not just increasing epitope diversity, but we are also increasing sensitivity. So in other words, how do we ensure that the antibodies can bind simultaneously to the target, so to generate uh, actual uh, for multiclonal? So one of the say that can be used for this is biolayer interferometry that normally is used to uh, determine binding kinetics, but can also be used to just the, to quantify the amount of uh, of antibody that is interacting with an antigen. And this is done by immobilizing the antigen, again, a human IgG molecule, on the head of a, a biosensor tip. And this surface is going to then be hit by a white light. And based on the thickness of the biomolecular layer that is formed by the binding of different antibodies to the antigen, is going to be reflected in different ways. And from these differences can be inferred the thickness of such a layer. So in other words, how much antibody is interacting with the antigen. And we see here when using saturating concentration, when applying one, three or five different antibodies that can bind simultaneously, we have a signal increase uh, quantified by the increase of the thickness of the layer. There are other methods to do that, all with a very wide detection range. And one of these is capillary electrophoresis, just to provide another example. In this case, the antigen, again, a human IgG molecule in blue in this uh, image, is uh, indirectly coupled uh, to the capillary wall. A capillary uh, where the antibody solution will run through at two times its saturating concentration and interact with this uh, destinated antigen. And then, uh, thanks to secondary antibody detection, we will see uh, the quantified signal in chemical minescence. We see it here in the graph on the right. Now, same for a second antibody. And interestingly, when applying both the antibodies still in saturating concentration, but the same overall total amount, we see that the signal is uh, increased by 100%. It is because both antibodies are binding simultaneously. Those are obviously candidates for a multiclonal mixture. Of course, polyspecificity is not all about uh, sensitivity. It's also about specificity. And in this case, we wanted to generate a multiclonal uh, anti-human FC that is only human specific and not showing any cross reactivity to other species. So thanks to the possibility to identify each component of the multiclonal mix, it's very easy to isolate and remove those antibodies that may cause some cross reactivity. As we see here, antibody number nine that is cross reacting to rabbit. On the contrary, we may desire some specific type of cross reactivity. Like in this case, we want to obtain binding to all IgG subclasses. And in this case, it's important to balance the contribution of each single monoclonal 
so to cover uh, the different specificities. For example, antibody 7 is obviously suffering uh, from the lack of binding to human IgG4, and this has to be counterbalanced by adding an antibody that is reacting against this antigen. So overall, I hope that with this brief introduction, introduction to our anti-human multiclonal product, uh, we gave an idea that it's possible to fuse the best of two worlds, uh, the specificity and the possibility to act on uh, monospecific antibodies like with monoclonal and the sensitivity and the epitope diversity of polyclonals without carrying all the drawbacks of these technologies. But there is no antibody that is by default considered valuable to be worked with if it's not thoroughly characterized. And uh, in this respect, I believe that recombinant antibodies don't have an advantage per se, but an indirect advantage, which derives from the fact that uh, they are sequence defined and uh, are limited in reproducibility, which means that they are perennial products, in other words. They are perennial uh, immortal, if, if you like. And thanks to phage display and molecular engineering, they also can be adapted to the assay and customized. And in my opinion, these two factors together uh, justify an even more uh, strong, intense effort in the characterization of these antibodies compared to an animal derived antibodies which has limited, which has an expiring date, so to say. And to give an idea of the way we characterize antibodies at Upcalis, I would like to show you how we did so in testing more than 100 antibodies within the framework of our COVID-19 diagnostic project that is only three months old, where we uh, characterize antibodies against spike and nucleocapsid protein. And we did so with the, with the goal, with the objective, to generate uh, positive control for uh, serological tests as well as uh, antibodies for direct virus detection in antigen tests. And I'm very proud uh, to announce that the first tests are actually ongoing in our partners laboratories, and we are very looking forward uh, for the first results. So back to the characterization. Uh, for sake of time, I'm just going to mention uh, the pipeline in respect of one particular clone that is uh, antibody 68 uh, and anti S1 SARS CoV 2 antibody. So, the first step is truly to verify that uh, in the new format, after form format conversion, the antibody is still retaining its specificity towards the antigen. In this case, the SARS CoV 2 S1 domain. And uh, so, after conversion to the mouse IgG format, we verified that the antibody could interact with the soluble antigen as well as the plate immobilized. And you see here in sandwich ELISA binding to uh, the soluble one to the first and indirect ELISA to the second. And the antibody 68, so as many other antibodies we tested so far, could recognize the antigen in both assays. A little bit more uh, exciting because of the repercussion at the agnostic level is the binding to the nature antigen. This is because we don't know actually how the uh, antigen is presented in the saliva of uh, infected patients. So uh, the antigen may be presented as perfectly folded in its uh, native conformation on uh, uh, well-assembled and infectious virus particles, as well as can be present in some fractions as uh, degraded soluble protein may be fragmented. And so it's useful to see how the antibody uh, could eventually react against uh, partially denatured antigen. We did so in Western blot on uh, uh, no reduced but SDS treated antigen. And um, we used for this purpose S1 human FC fused antigen simply because this allowed to have a positive control, a reference uh, while staining the molecule with anti human IgG. And uh, was very positive to notice that among other antibodies, also this clone reacted against the denatured antigen. Even more important for diagnostic applications is to be aware that the antibody can recognize not only the recombinant antigen, but also uh, the actual virus particles, even if after inactivation. And this was brilliantly done by our colleagues at the HCTI uh, that uh, fixed SARS-CoV-2 infected cells three days after infection and uh, stain them with our antibody or uh, commercially available uh, double send RNA J2 hybrid home antibody. And you see here, first of all, that if, despite the very high concentration, 20 microgram per milliliter, that is just a test concentration later on lowered uh, by uh, factor 10, that there was no cross-reactivity whatsoever on uninfected cells, a very positive uh, sign for us of uh, uh, high specificity of our antibody and a perfect uh, recognition of the infected cells. 
On the other side, we see that uh, the current commercial alternative is uh, relatively weak, uh, despite uh, fairly specific. It's also important to notice that uh, the fixation in this case had to compile to the Robert Koch Institute uh, indication for uh, uh, virus inactivation, which means that are particularly extreme, normally 4% FA, 10 minutes is sufficient. And this I mention only because uh, the cells were treated so harshly that um, the antigen may have been modified to the point that could not be recognized anymore. We see here even better the absence of specificity in uninfected cells uh, while for the commercial antibody we actually notice a slight high cross reactivity. Besides binding we also have to take in account uh, antibody stability. First of all we tend to always validate that the freshly produced antibody is present in mainly in its monomeric state, and we do so analyzing the molecular weight distribution in size exclusion chromatography. And uh, later on, we pass to the validation of the shelf half life by incubating the antibody at different temperature in the absence of stabilizer or protectants, and uh, test after defined period of time. In this case, we couldn't test over 90 days because this is the time span that so far, so far characterized the project overall. And um, we were pleased to see that. Uh, Functionally speaking, the antibody did, didn't uh, reduce any uh, sensitivity after the incubation for 90 days at 4 degrees and only slightly after incubation at higher temperatures. But if you want to uh, also verify that the antibody is really um, reproducible in its behavior, you also have to uh, validate different antibody batches. This is what we claimed at the beginning, recombinant antibodies uh, can be reproduced limitedly. And to give an example of that, we produced six times the same antibody in the same format and then evaluated the, the performance in ELISA. And you can see here from the overlap of the different binding curves that they are essentially the same. When plotting together the signal, you can see that the uh, standard deviation is almost absent. Finally, if you want to use an antibody uh, in diagnostic applications, it's not enough to verify that uh, it's not sticky as we did checking the binding on uninfected cells. You also have to evaluate the possibility, the eventuality that there may be some cross reactivity to the closest, most closely related antigens. And of course, we are talking about the S1 protein from other human coronaviruses, and particularly the SARS CoV, which at least in the antibody binding region, which is the receptor binding domain, uh, can reach even 74% of sequence identity. And there is no bioinformatic way to solve this problem so that only empirical data can actually uh, answer. Here we see from the binding comparison to the different human coronaviruses as one that there is no significant cross reactivity to any of those. Finally, it's important to take into account that uh, unfortunately the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, is also mutating uh, at very fast uh, pace, and that uh, at least for those mutations that are the most common, the default in the antibody binding region, it's important to verify that uh, the antibody binding is not affected, is not reduced by the presence of the mutation. And we did so empirically once again, uh, comparing the binding of our antibody to the wild type uh, SARS-CoV-2 S1 uh, in respect of the other variants that you see here. And likely there was no binding reduction for none of these cases. So finally, I hope that I could give you uh, at least uh, a first evidence that recombinant antibodies can be used for diagnostic applications and that can constitute a concrete alternative to animal-derived antibodies. With this, I would really like to thank you for the attention and I would like to thank my whole team uh, for the great uh, work and the great time so far and also the whole Department of Biotechnology that was so cooperative all this time and uh, uh, all other cooperators and partners, of course, uh, the funding agencies that are supporting our work. Thanks and I'm happy to take questions after the next seminar. Thank you, Julia. Uh, as a reminder, we will hold all questions to the end, but please send them in at any time using the GoToWebinar questions panel, and we will ask them after our next presentation. Speaking next will be Dr. Charu Chandra Sekera. Dr. Chandra Sekera is the founder and executive director of the Canadian Center for Alternatives to Animal Methods.
which aims to develop, validate, and promote non-animal human biology-based platforms in biomedical research, education, and chemical safety testing. She is a biochemist and molecular biologist, a former animal researcher, and a science policy expert. She is spearheading a recombinant antibody development and validation project with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Thank you, Catherine. It is such a pleasure to be here to talk about a topic that's very dear to my heart. This has been a great seminar series, so thank you for the invitation. Good morning, everyone. Well, if you've been following the seminar series, you've heard from so many experts in the field about the state of affairs with respect to animal and non-animal ant antibodies. So my goal today is not to go through the same information, but to share with you my story, my real life story as a biomedical researcher who has been and still uses antibodies on a daily basis. So antibodies can be broadly classified into three main categories based on utility, research, diagnostics, and therapeutics. And each of these categories requires unique properties to meet their unique needs. So my focus today will only be on antibodies used exclusively for research purposes. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, antibodies serve as an integral tool in the life sciences. It is the lifeline of the life sciences, in fact. I don't think biomedical research can exist without antibodies. We need these reagents for everything from the detection and quantification of biological processes in health and disease. But antibodies are also our nemesis. It's a lifeline that flatlines very easily, at least when it comes to animal-derived antibodies. So I'm going to share my story. I'll start with my story at the beginning to give you a glimpse into my struggles and my successes with antibodies, which were few and far in between. Um, the story of, of um, how everything unfolded over the last 20 years. So I started my PhD work characterizing an antibody, a superb antibody, might I add. Um, I started working on characterizing structure function relationships in the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, or CIRCA isoform 3, using this mouse monoclonal antibody called PLIM430. Um, so CIRCA calcium transporters play a critical role in calcium signaling in pretty much every cell or tissue type in the body. So this antibody, PLIM430, actually inhibited its function. It uh, inhibited calcium transport by uncoupling ATP hydrolysis, which are two very intricately linked events in nature. So as you can see on this blot, the antibody was very clean. It was There was no nonspecific binding. It would only recognize the human circa 3 isoform with no other cross-reactivity or anything else. And then in the middle panel, you can see that um, it inhibited the calcium uptake activity and ATP hydrolysis. And I actually mapped the epitope of this antibody. It turned out the antibody recognizes two regions in this protein. Regions, if you look at the amino acid sequence, are located far apart. But if you look at the three-dimensional crystal structure of circa 3, they actually come together um, when it's sitting on that ER membrane. So the antibody actually brings two different regions together and it uncouples ATP hydrolysis from uh, calcium transport. Um, you know, it was a success story. That's what you would think, right? It was, actually, it was a great success story and I had no issues with anybody's when I was in grad school. Well, all that changed when I started my postdoctoral work. I moved into my postdoctoral work investigating heart failure using mouse models, looking at the role of adenosine and beta adrenergic receptor dimerization in ischemia reperfusion injury. So that's when all the troubles began. Uh, G protein coupled receptors are large hydrophobic transmembrane proteins, and they're not very easy to develop antibodies against. So we actually had three different mouse lines in the laboratory. We had an adenosine receptor 1, 2A, and 2B knockouts, and we also had tissues from collaborators um, who had beta-adrenergic receptor knockout animals. 
So even with these knockout tissues, we were not able to validate these antibodies. We could not get them to work over a three year period of time. I'm not sure how many antibodies I tried. I bought antibodies from every big vendor, from every species, and I spent countless hours optimizing to get specific data. Honestly, it was one of these processes where you buy an antibody, you try it out, you optimize, you throw it out, then you repeat, then you do it again and again, um, hoping for success with a vendor or with a different species, with whatever that you can get, because it was critical to have these antibodies to look at these proteins and, and the pathways um, and how they were dimerizing. You know, I was doing all these different characterizations, but we were not successful. Um, the, the blot shown here in the middle, it's actually not my blot. Uh, it's not from you know, the work that I did what, more than 10 years ago now. I did a Google search last night for using the terms ugly Western blot, and this showed up. Um, so I was, uh, you know, I was really wondering who took these out of my notebooks to post online. But these blots are very reminiscent of my continued struggle during my postdoctoral years, for years. It was not possible to optimize any of these antibodies simply because they lacked the specificity that I needed. So I only I ended up publishing all the mouse work only with gene expression data because I could not get any protein expression data with these antibodies. I know there are other people in the field who published, um, you know, taking information from blocks like this by cutting off a band that corresponded to the correct size, but I didn't do it. Um, for the mouse work, it was just impossible to find the specificity that we needed, but I did get a lucky break, and it's only because I used human tissue at the very end um, to validate some of my uh, animal studies, and two of the antibodies, um, one against adenosine, one against the beta adrenergic receptor, worked on human tissue, and if you're thinking this is actually an immunoprecipitation, so if you're looking at um, the, the bands there, the two bands around 37, those, the receptors are glycosylated, so those are not non-specific binding, they're actually very specific binding, um, the, the difference in size is due to glycosylation, and then the isoforms on top, the, the latter like effect that you see, that's also due to oligomerization that you would see with some of these G-protein coupled receptors. So it worked on human tissue. But fast forward a whole decade, now I'm in a different situation. I have my own research center, um, not just any lab, but a lab where I'm not doing any animal testing at all, a lab where I promote the replacement of animals in research and testing, including the replacement of animal derived components in research. So one of the main areas um, in my lab is creating disease in a dish using 3D bioprinted human tissue. These are complex multicellular tissue models that require extensive characterization for the cell types being used and also the pathways um, that are being activated in these tissues. So I need dozens and dozens and dozens of antibodies just to validate one tissue model. So I'm forced to buy animal-derived antibodies because non-animal antibodies for these targets are not commercially available. I have looked high and low and I can't find animal-free versions of everything I need, and I honestly don't have the time or the funds to create a couple of hundred unique recombinant hand antibodies right now. So I continue to use animal-derived antibodies, just like I did over the past 20 years, and I continue to run into problems just like I did over the past 20 years. Um, the only difference is that unlike in the first or the second decade of my career as a biomedical researcher, now I actually care about where my antibodies come from and lament over it about why we haven't made progress in this field to replace the use of animals um, in antibody production. So let me give you a very quick uh, status update from my lab. You know that expression, damned if you do, damned if you don't? Well, I like to use a milder version of it to describe what I experience routinely with antibodies. So this is just an example from one of the tissue models, the liver in a dish model. It contains five cell types, and so we need dozens of specific markers for the cell types, as well as all the pathways that we're looking at in liver tissue. Um, and these are, you know, different antibodies, like the, the blocks here. Uh, these, are for, these are for multiple targets from different companies, different species. I've tried it all, mouse, goat, rabbit, rat, 
chicken, um, whatever is available out there for so many of these crucial markers that I absolutely need to validate some of my, my models. But these are some of the representative results that I get. There's non-specific binding or there's no binding. And, you know, sometimes we like to play a game in the lab called pick a band. You know, God knows, you just pick one, but we don't do that, obviously. Um, but this is just really frustrating to have to go through this. And these are the real life stories of biomedical research. It's not just me, but this happens in so many labs all over the place. And people still talk about, people still question um, why recombinant antibodies are better. Um, and so I, before I get into all of that, I do have to say that there was this one problem that we managed to resolve, but after about two months of work, I was looking for a very specific antibody, an albumin antibody. Um, you know, it's the primary marker for liver function that we're using in our in vitro model. And you can see that I was looking for one albumin antibody that would only recognize the human albumin, albumin isoform. And even though the product sheets from all these companies would say that they do, they don't just recognize the human. It would recognize only the human if you're using human serum plant samples. But I have fetal bovine serum in my tissue models right now, which I'm trying to get, you know, away from. But in the meantime, I'm using that. And so the these antibodies recognize both the bovine and the human isoform. And finally, I managed to find one antibody after testing like a dozen, um, the one on the right, um, that recognizes only the human isoform. And so I'm faced with this grueling process of validating animal derived antib antibodies for the foreseeable future. And you know, some of these companies, and I'm not picking on a particular vendor, but most of these companies, they leave it up to the end user to go through this tedious trial and error process of validating these antibodies. And some companies do offer a validated antibodies, but I don't know what they are because most of the ones that I purchased, the ones that I showed you in the previous slide, they were validated, but they still lack the specificity and the affinity that I need. You know, I do blame it on the antibodies. I think these experts were right. Um, we, we, we don't need more scientific evidence to show that animal-derived antibodies compromise research. Honestly, for me, it has been money down the drain. And don't forget the animal welfare issues in antibody production. Remember when Santa Cruz got fined $3.5 million for violating the Animal Welfare Act? These are all very real problems. And one of the things that I, I do have to say on a positive note is that the field is changing. Even some antibodies, uh, I think the, the term recombinant is misused oftentimes, um, if, 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 even for antibodies that involve animal immunization at the, at the beginning. So I, I guess animal free would be uh, a better term to use, but companies are trying to move away. So we do have to give them some credit uh, for, for certain things that they are trying to, to make these antibodies more specific, higher affinity, and as animal free as they can be. So to me, a truly animal free recombinant antibody is one that's isolated from a phage library without animal immunization at all. And then companies like the Ab Abcam are really trying um, and BioRad, uh, there are a number of other companies, I think other researchers, or other seminar speakers have already presented. Uh, there are lots of companies that are offering these options, but they're very limited. So at the end of the day, um, this is the right way to move forward we need to stop this process of continually you know using animals to generate these antibodies that we need um and this is an extensive report uh, put together by you know global experts um and it is it outlines um, how we could really tackle this um issue and how we could provide better reagents for re for um research and also look after animal welfare but um, and this report contains a lot of scientific evidence, but um, I, people still whine and complain and write angry editorials with bogus claims based on myths and misconceptions. I'm not surprised because we've seen this before in human history. Remember how long it took to convince people, even doctors, that smoking is bad for health? Well, we're going through that same thing with antibodies right now, I feel. People still want more evidence. Well, there's a lot of evidence out there if you're looking in the right place. 
And so just to give you a very quick overview, um, I am involved in an antibody project and I do not have all the data at the moment because the lab was shut down for six months and we just reopened about three weeks ago. So this was a project that we started in March, just before the lockdown. I bought a bunch of 100% animal free antibodies from a couple of companies and I wanted to compare them side by side with um, animal derived antibodies. So um, I, this is just one example. I did not get to finish that project. Um, the one caveat I have to mention here is that these are different antibodies. So the, the one on the left is mouse, the one in the middle is rabbit, and the one on the right is the human 100% um, recombinant animal free antibody. So it's not a perfect side by side comparison because all of the secondary antibodies that I had to use for these Western blots were different. So that would introduce the variability. So you can't really quantify this by densitometry as it is, but I am going to try this again with uh, one um, secondary antibody like a protein HEHRP, but even then different um, isoforms, mouse, rabbit, and human will have different affinities to protein ANG. So this is one thing that I'm doing just for my own sake and for to include in a publication that we're preparing on this other project that I've been doing with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. We're actually creating two different antibodies. One um, to compare against an antibody that's uh, a really good antibody, but it's, it's made using the mouse ascites method. And the other one is we're making a mock polyclonal antibody uh, to compare against a very prominent um, rabbit polyclonal antibody against a phosphorylated target. This is just um, some preliminary data to show you what we've gotten so far for the um, the mouse ascites antibody. So as you can see on the ELISA plots, um, there is really good binding with this one clone. We have isolated multiple clones from this library. Um, and we could see extremely good and specific high affinity binding. And on the right, you can see, um, it's, it's an image from the supplier's website, what, what it looks like. So here in this project, I'm actually cloning these human antibodies into a mouse IgG1 backbone so that I could compare them using it, the exact same conditions, including the secondary antibodies. So hold tight, this data will be published within a few months if everything goes well. And um, so I will keep you posted on that. So at the end of the day, I think the evidence exists. You just have to look in the right place and we truly evaluate the scientific um, evidence. Recombinant antibodies offer unique advantages over animal-derived antibodies. It is possible to pre predefine the target, the epitope, and even include conformational epitopes, which are not possible with immunized animals. I don't need to go through this whole thing because so many people have already given you the advantages of um, anim non-animal antibodies. Um, so what more do we really want? What could we possibly ask for? How much more evidence do we really need? I guess we humans have a very unique species specific way of dealing with scientific evidence. And I would really like um, everyone, the researchers, um, the, the industry and um, regulators, policymakers, everyone to really come together and tackle this problem. Because think about it, by 2035, if we're at this position where we are um, uh, evaluating the safety of a pesticide without using animals, are you really going to tell me that we can't generate antibodies for research without using animals? It just doesn't make sense. This is more about opening your mind without preconceived biases to the scientific evidence and trying to advance a field where we could very easily replace animals. Well, this should have been done more than a decade ago, but now we have the opportunity. So um, I would like to open the floor to questions and also collegial collaborations to, to move, this for, move this field forward in North America. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Charu. And, and thanks again, Julia, for two really wonderful presentations, nice perspectives from both of you. Um, so we do have time now for some questions for both of our speakers. Again, as uh, Catherine mentioned at the outset, if we'll use the Q&A box to enter questions for either speaker, and we'll try and address those in sequence. 
Um, the first question is uh, specific for Julia. Um, does Abcalis use only naive libraries for antibody generation or also immune libraries? So thanks for the question. Um, well, uh, first of all, I would like to distinguish between uh, animal uh, immune libraries and uh, um, human immune libraries in the sense that uh, you can always uh, collect some uh, blood from a patient, like it has been the case right now for SARS-CoV patients all over the world, right? Um, as well as after vaccination. So this is the main difference. So we, uh, so far, uh, generate antibodies using only human derived libraries, uh, either naive most of the times or for specific cases uh, like SARS CoV, also uh, after, uh, let's say, spontaneous immunization by infection. So uh, I guess that this answered the, the question. Thank you, Julia. Um, we have a question here, I guess, that could be uh, directed to either Charu or Julia. Um, it seems that the major obstacle to the use of non-animal driving antibodies is the lack of awareness in the vast majority of the scientific community. In your opinion, how should this lack of awareness be addressed or can it be addressed? Okay, um, I'll give this a go. Um, there are multiple ways to do this. I think, um, so from a researcher point of view, um, we, we no longer can use this excuse, right? When you're a biomedical researcher, you're constantly doing searches online um, to find the most relevant scientific um, evidence in your field. And so you could put the same effort into these things, um, but more than the onus on the onus researcher, I think the onus is on funding agencies and publishers to put pressure on the system to make that change. Researchers won't do it on their own. So if you had an agency like the National Institutes of Health saying that you must resort to non-animal antibodies as much as possible, um, then it would certainly create that awareness from a, a, a you know, top-down process um, and give the industry an incentive to change. And that will also trickle down to researchers um, to start adopting these methodologies. The literature, as you've seen in that European Commission report, the literature, um, the evidence is there that these antibodies are better. I can only subscribe uh, with all that has been said and also maybe thank one more the organizer of this seminar because this is definitely one of, of the uh, key also of, of fighting the unawareness is surely to speak more about this and just give the stage and give possibility uh, to groups like ours to describe about uh, all the good examples that the recombinant antibody field can uh, produce in respect of uh, uh, generating good alternatives. Okay, thanks both. And yes, indeed, Julio, the, the, a very uh, primary purpose for this webinar series is just that, uh, to try and to communicate those messages um, to all stakeholders. Um, okay, is there a cost comparison analysis for the production or even for research? If commercialized, will they be cost effective? So I will... Oh, sorry. So now, uh, why don't you go ahead, please describe your company's view on that and then. Well, it's going to be very short if this can help. Um, so uh, we, of course, tried because this is a key aspect for uh, uh, all the, the customers. And uh, it's not the case that I think that the, the big revolution will happen when the, the biggest player that can better reduce cost of, uh, of production will uh, come into action. But uh, one, one thing that has to be said is that it's not enough to quantify the cost of generating an antibody. Uh, I guess that in this case, it's, it's surely uh, cheaper to just feed a goat, um, but definitely uh, it has to be taken account the fact that, for example, abolishing completely uh, the, the use of animals means to completely uh, eliminate all the farms. So reducing only the space dedicated to the generation of antibodies to the laboratories. And this is already an aspect. The other aspect is the fact that we mentioned before, an antibody against a certain target that is sequence defined is immortal. And that means that maybe the first time it has to be generated and characterized is gonna be a little bit more laborious, especially if you wanna do it well. But then this product is gonna last forever. So the question is just how much are we willing 
no, to obtain this other leg, I would say, of product compared to uh, expiring date uh, signed product like the animal derived polyclonals. And I, I agree with that. And if you were looking at some of those um, antibodies that I purchased uh, from commercial sources, they are the exact same price as animal derived antibodies. Uh, if you were to do a price comparisons per like 100 micrograms of antibody or something. Um, and the, the thing to really keep in mind is that there will be some initial cost involved in setting it up, but it will pay off in the long run. And if you're looking at some of these major animal uh, producers, uh, companies that produce animals for research purposes, it's gonna be pocket change for them. I mean, look at even companies like Abcam that acquired Axiomics to do this recombinant work. Um, it would, and there are companies like that that are doing it. And for smaller companies, even for them, if you were to get rid of the cost of animal husbandry and all of that stuff, and you invest a little bit more in, um, cell culture spaces and cell culture work, it's not a very big transition um, or it's not a very costly transition. So at the end of the day, it is possible to develop antibodies that are cost effective um, or at least comparable, if not even better cost effective than the animal derived versions. Okay, great, thanks both. Um, I suppose this is another question that either of you can uh, take a stab at. Um, we hear all the time that developed and validated non-animal methods in a variety of areas, uh, including antibodies, are available, yet very few are actually being utilized. What is it going to take to drive adoption of these non-animal methods, and will legislation to mandate and enforce utilization of non-animal methods be required? I, uh... I, th I would love to see some legislation. You know how um, the EU did this, like, you know, similar to what the EU did with the cosmetics directive, give people a certain timeline to change, right? Five years from now, you must resort, like change all of your facilities and all of your um, pipeline to non-animal, give a certain time period and let the industry adjust and then also bring in legislation especially for publicly funded research the nih could very easily bring in a, a strict policy to restrict um, the use of animals um, for antibody production or the restrict to restrict the use of uh, animal derived antibodies in publicly funded research and i think the industry will change quickly i 100 percent believe in legislation and, and strict policy guidelines um, to drive that initial change Maybe from my side, I can only add that probably it's because I'm uh, very new to the field in some sense. That, uh, it's six years now that I, I work with recombinant antibodies and uh, uh, maybe I had to wait less for these changes to happen, but I have the impression that things are moving and the outcome report is uh, a major step in this direction. So I'm really looking forward to the coming years and uh, I, I really expect these changes to happen soon. Okay, well, I think we have covered the, the bulk of the questions that have come in for the speakers. Um, we'll wait another 30 seconds or so to see if any additional questions come in. But in the interim, I, I want to take this opportunity to again thank everyone for your participation and, and engagement in today's webinar, and particularly thank uh, Julio and, and Charu for two excellent presentations. Um, I'd also like to encourage folks to register for the next, the, the fourth webinar in our series um, on accessibility of recombinant antibodies. We're very excited to have Dr. Pierre Cosson from the University of Geneva and Dr. Michael Feiberg, Feiberg excuse me, from Absolute Antibody um, to provide some perspectives on November the 12th. And you can see on the screen their registration information and certainly if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please do not hesitate to contact myself or Catherine We're off directly. Not seeing any additional questions. So with that in mind, I think we can conclude today's webinar and thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thank you, David. Actually, once again, thanks a lot for guys this wonderful webinar series and looking forward to the next session. Yeah, thank you all. All right. Bye-bye.